Doesn't work? I've only got so many buttons I can push up here. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Grant Vamishoten. Uh, my family and I arrived yesterday, enjoyed some time at the uh, Canelta in Rimby pool party for us. It was very fun. And excited, excited I am this morning to um, be able to share with you from God's Word. Uh, why don't we ask for God's help here to begin? So let's pray. Father God, it's, it's good to be here to, in, in your house um, with your people. And uh, Jesus, I wish that you yourself actually could come and be our teacher this morning. Uh, because your love is perfect and you know each one of us and you know how you could best teach us this morning. But God, we're so grateful that your Holy Spirit is here and helping us to learn and teaching us to know you better and to worship you more, um, sharing your peace and your love with us, helping us to understand how we ought to live. So use this time, we pray, God, to bring us together in unity, um, closer to you, and uh, let this be a morning where this church is encouraged in Jesus Christ, finds healing in Jesus Christ, and is brought together as a strong family who can accomplish much in this part of the world for Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. 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 So the question we want to start off with this morning is, what does it mean to trust? Now, some synonyms for the word trust are believe or entrust, have faith in. Uh, on the way here this morning, I saw some horses in the field across the road. I believe that there's horses there. But do I trust them enough to get on and take me for a ride? Believing and trusting, right? Uh, you could believe that there is a car in the parking lot, but do you trust it and the driver to get you safely where you're going? You can believe that Jesus is the light of the world, Savior, but do you trust him with the decisions of your day-to-day -day life, today even? So I want to learn how to trust Jesus, especially through the valleys of life. More than believing that he is God, it's acting in ways and following his teaching through his word. I want to understand what he says and, and try to live that out. And to do that, I, of course, will need lots of help. Uh, the help of the church, the help of the Holy Spirit, the help of, of God helping me to understand how do I live out this life and, and guiding me. So not only this morning do I want to encourage you to believe in Jesus, I want to encourage you to trust him with your whole life today. There is a simple and a profound answer that Jesus gives for why we should have a confident trust. It's found in John eleven twenty five. 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So the imagery of the valley of death is one that I'm going to borrow from Psalm 23. You might know it. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Now, maybe some this morning may be in this valley. Maybe this is a really difficult time. Uh, maybe death is on the horizon. Others here don't really think too much about death. Maybe we perceive it to be somewhere very off in the distance. That's for tomorrow to think about. But it's in the valley of death maybe that we become the most aware of the comfort and the hope and the promise of the resurrected life that Jesus has for us. So the, the passage of focus is John chapter 11. You might want to turn there. We're going to be there for basically the entire message. So John chapter 11. And what is beginning, or what's happening at the start of John 11? What's going on here? Well, chapter 10 ends with the attempted arrest of Jesus. He escapes. And he goes somewhere far away from Jerusalem where the arrest was supposed to take place. So what calls him out of this escape? What's going to call, call, um, call him out is an appeal for help from his dear friends Mary and Martha. Coming back into a public place is not going to be a small decision. It's a big deal. Uh, this, the disciples with Jesus, they know how dangerous Jerusalem is. They don't want to go near it. And so the action that Jesus is going to take on behalf of Mary and Martha in response to their request for help for their brother Lazarus, um, that's actually going to be enough to push the Jewish pharisaical leadership into a decided movement to kill Jesus. This this is coming right near the end of his ministry here. So let's pick it up in verse 1. 
Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now this Mary, whose whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. I want to underline the word love there. Lord, the one you love is sick. We can tell from this that Jesus had a relationship with his family. There's a a big hint that there was a friendship that was there. It's barely explored in this passage, but we can see there was something going on. Mary and Martha knew that Jesus loved Lazarus, and so they asked for his help. So right away, a tangential application for us. We can ask Jesus for his help in others' lives because we know of his love for them. We can pray with faith. Think of one of the favorite people that you have in your life. Imagine if you got word that that person desperately needed your help. How would you respond? Now, remember that Jesus has a love for each of us that is perfect. It's incredible. If he is asked for help, don't you think he'll be moved to help, that he want to take some sort of action? So let's be people who pray for the ones that we love, trusting that Jesus will help them. Verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. This is on purpose. He's staying two days longer. The timing is going to work out so that he will arrive on the fourth day of Lazarus' death. Now, the distance from where he is to where Lazarus is is about 150 kilometers. He's in a place where John used to do his ministry, just south of the Sea of uh, Galilee, and it's also in a place called Bethany. So he's going to go from Bethany to Bethany. And so let's use some Alberta geography to sort of get a lay of the land for the distance here, okay? I'm from Calgary, so we're going to call Calgary Jerusalem in this one. Have you ever done a road trip all the way down to Calgary? Did you go through Red Deer? Let's call Red Deer the first Bethany, okay? And then the second Bethany is supposed to be about two kilometers outside of Jerusalem, so we're going to call that Airdrie. So that's the distance that he's going to have to walk from Red Deer slash Bethany all the way down to Airdrie, and that's, that's how far he's got to go. So it's approximately a four-day walk to see Lazarus and to be only two kilometers away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place where the Pharisees rule from. And, of course, that's a group of people who have their sights set on killing Jesus. It's a dangerous thing. Verse 7. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you. And yet you're going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. So, we don't have the time. I'm not going to take the time to go in depth here on what Jesus is saying. But here's a basic idea. Safety comes from following Jesus. Stumbling comes when we stray away from him. Sometimes that can mean following Jesus into a dangerous situation. But it's safer to be in a dangerous situation in God's care than in what would seem like a safe and risk-free situation in our own care. So Jesus and the disciples were about to head into a dangerous situation, but they were following the will of God the Father, And so they were walking in the light. Verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. That's what the doctor says, right? If you're sick, you should sleep a little bit and get better. The disciples know what's up. Verse 13. Jesus had been speaking of his death, But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. 
but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, that means twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. They know what's up. They know it's dangerous. They take the four-day journey from Bethany to Bethany and end up about two kilometers away from Jerusalem. And here's where we're going to see um, Mar- Mar- Martha and Mary. So let's get a little background on them. We can learn a little bit about this family from both the Gospels of Luke and the Gospels of John. And I think of Mary and Martha, I'm guessing that they're probably somewhere in their 20s. I could be wrong. But in Jewish families, the home could be passed down to the eldest son. So the fact that they're all living there in the same house says that Mary and Martha probably aren't married yet. If they would, they would have been off in their husband's home. And so maybe it's safe to say that they're a tightly knit group of three. They've got each other's backs. They've also got their own personalities, of course. Uh, We learn about Mary that she is not afraid to show emotion, also not afraid to challenge the norms. In, In Luke 10, we see her, Mary, learning at the feet of Jesus, which is a place normally reserved for the men. But there she is, and Jesus welcomes her and supports her desire to learn from him. Uh, That's not something that Martha would feel comfortable with doing, from what I could see. Martha seems to be practical, active, outspoken. I'm guessing she's the older sibling, because she certainly acts that way. Uh, She cares for Mary. She lets Mary know what the rules are. Martha also demonstrates a quiet confidence in Jesus. She knows that he could heal. She knows he's the Messiah, the Son of God. We know a lot less about Lazarus, except for the fact that he was loved by Jesus. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, this is something that we have to learn from the manners and customs of that time. There was actually a superstition built into the way that people grieved in this Middle Eastern culture. They believed that the soul hovered around the body for three days. So on the fourth day, that is when all hope was gone. No hope for anything then. And that is also when the loudest wailing would begin. It was a total of seven days of grief that would occur. So significantly, Jesus arrives on the fourth day, the day when all the hope is gone. The wailing had begun. The sisters are grieving as they're walking through the valley of death. Verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. So John, the author here, is careful to point out the proximity to Jerusalem. We've already talked about how it's a seat of power. It's where the authorities are who want to kill Jesus. Dangerous place for him to be at this point in time. Also the place where God the Father wants for him to be. But it was close enough that many of the friends who lived in Jerusalem had made the trip out to Bethany to grieve with the sisters. Verse 19, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Well, some of us here this morning might identify with Martha. We hurry off to confront Jesus directly. We don't wait. We take a walk towards Christ. We let him know exactly what is on our hearts. And if you are going through something this morning and you have questions, then maybe put yourself into Martha's shoes and follow her example. Go to Jesus with your questions. He can handle them. Ask him why things worked out the way that they did. Maybe ask him why he didn't respond sooner. And if we're to learn anything from Martha, maybe it is that we should be prepared to be blown away with the response that Jesus would give. Because his love was bigger than whatever she might have imagined. And this timing that he was in charge of, it was all for the glory of God and for her good as well. Jesus was never out of control. Keep in mind that Martha doesn't fully understand what's going to happen until the end. This chapter hasn't finished yet, right? She doesn't see that Lazarus is going to rise. And oftentimes, we won't fully understand right away either. She's just trusting Jesus in the moment. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Martha isn't complaining. Instead, she's demonstrating a confident trust in this valley of death. 
she is in pain, and her heart is very heavy, and she trusts that Jesus could have healed her brother. She trusts that Jesus is still on her side, that she has not been abandoned. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And the way that Jesus responds to Martha now is probably the key to this whole passage. If you're going to memorize a verse from today's message, this is a good one. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So what Jesus is doing here is taking Martha's abstract belief in a future resurrection and directing her to a present moment of belief. What's she going to do right now with that belief? She can believe right now in Jesus. She can believe right now that he is the resurrection. Believe right now that he is the Lord of life. For there is neither resurrection or life outside of Jesus Christ. What's she going to do with it? He continues, And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Is this make or break for Martha? How she responds, maybe not in this moment, but in in the entirety of her life, is going to have a huge impact on her future. Martha, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Now, when you think about it, that's an amazing statement to make in the middle of grief. I think that we'd all be blessed to have that sort of a faith as we walk through dark valleys. And if God can help Martha have that kind of a confident trust, he can help us as well. Continuing on. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got, out, she got up quickly and went to him. And Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been in Mary's house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. And Mary's going to appear much more emotional than Martha. She's crying. Maybe Martha's trying to give Mary a quiet private place to meet with Jesus, away from the crowd, but the crowd misinterprets Mary's actions. They think she's going to the tomb to mourn, and they're going to go and mourn with her. So this conversation that Jesus is about to have with Mary will be heard by the crowd. But Mary is not the type of a lady, we will see, who will put on a mask when she is in a crowd. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Could you see Mary falling at Jesus' feet? Maybe she's out of strength. Maybe she's just drained emotionally and physically. And once again, I don't read a complaining spirit into her words. She's simply stating the truth. He could have healed Lazarus. And I would wager a guess at this moment that Mary did not understand God's timing. Why did he take so long? Why did he wait another two days? You know, it is easy to praise God in hindsight when we see how everything worked out. But it's more of an act of faith to trust his timing inside of the valley when things are difficult. And so here's Mary, and she's weeping. And Jesus loves her. And it's hard to watch somebody who you love as they're on the ground weeping and broken and spent. And when Jesus saw her weeping... And the Jews who had come along with her, also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Now Jesus knew what the outcome would be, didn't he? He knew it was going to be for the glory of God. Yet, here he is, weeping with Mary. Jesus knows the exact outcome of your life as well. He knows what eternity holds for you, yet he weeps with you in your sorrows, trials, and valleys. God Almighty weeps with those who weep. And we do a good job of representing God when we do the same. When we mourn with those who mourn and allow for them to have a hopeful grief. 
carrying on. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. And then Jesus said, did I, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I think he might have looked like an Egyptian mummy, all wrapped up with that cloth all around him. It might have taken him some effort, but he made it to the front of that tomb. He's alive from the dead. It was a, his resurrection, the resurrection of Lazarus, was a sign for all to see. Yes, this is Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So that's as much of that passage as we're going to read. But in this passage here, there's so much to learn. Um, there's so much to apply to life. And if there's one character in the story that we should all relate to, maybe it's Lazarus. Why Lazarus? Well, all we know about Lazarus in this passage is that he is dead and that Jesus loves him. So why should we relate to Lazarus? Well, number one, we know that Jesus loves us as well. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to question it. We can have this confident trust. Jesus loves me, we can say. And this love was proven once and for all when he faced death on a cross, not because he did anything wrong. He didn't die because of his sin. The prophet Isaiah teaches that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace, peace with God, that punishment was on him. And by his wounds, we're healed. Well, that is love. Taking on the burden of sin of the people you love so that they can be forgiven and so that they can be healed. So don't wonder. Jesus loves you. His death and resurrection is proof of his love. He proved when he rose from the grave that he actually has the power to forgive you to save you from the heavy weight of sin. The second way that we can all identify with Lazarus, the first is being that we are loved by Jesus, but the second way is that Lazarus was dead. And because of sin, if we're in a state of being in sin, we're spiritually dead. And you know, Lazarus was so dead that he couldn't save himself. He can't somehow have the power to get out of that tomb by himself, can he? He's dead. What can he do about it? And if you are in sin, you're spiritually, lit, spiritually dead. You can't work your way out of it. You're dead. There's nothing you can do about it. But Jesus called out, and Lazarus responded. And although he was unable to resurrect himself, Jesus was able to save him. In that same way, Jesus can save us from the devastation of sin. Jesus calls Lazarus to life, and he calls us to life as well. Real life really is only found in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of life. He promises that if we can learn how he's taught and apply that to our lives, he's going to work with us and help us to have abundant life. Nothing else will ever satisfy. Jesus is life. And when Jesus calls out to you and says, come out, do you want to come out of that tomb into the light of Jesus' life? How do you respond to Jesus? Now, Jesus spoke to to a Martha in a way that said, this is not some abstract thing. This is a thing you can do right now. What do you believe in this moment? It's, it's the same for us. What do we want to do with this? Do you want to have an abstract thought? Yes, Jesus is Lord. Or do you want to take him at his word and trust him to help us with our sins, to, to forgive us of our sins and make us whole? Do we want to read his word and say, this is the word of God. This teaches me about life. I, I need to apply this. It's more than just believing it. It's trusting it. 
John eleven twenty six. 26, whoever lives by believing in me, Jesus says, will never die. Do you believe this? You know, you could believe that there's a horse across the road. But do you trust the horse to give you a safe ride? You got to get on the horse. You got to go for the ride. You could believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But do you trust him with your life today and this week, with the things that are coming at you? We can trust, we can have a confident trust that no matter where we're at, through the highs and the lows, Jesus is with us. We can look at his word and take it at full face value and say, help me live out this truth that I'm reading. I don't just want to learn from you. I want to live out what I'm learning. And we can ask Jesus to show us how to have this full life that he came, lived, and died for us to have. So we're going to keep that in mind as we sing this uh, worship song. And then after that, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. So I'll invite the worship team up here. And uh, God bless you all.